you know, our partners like Microsoft have been working closely with us to say, well, can we accommodate all this information in an open platform that can be used for, for planning and conservation work all over the world? So Joe and his work are a kind of manifestation of bringing together science, bringing together computing, advanced computing, bringing together uh, social relationships with their community. I guess what gives me big hope for the conservation of our planet, uh, the idea of saving 30% or 50% of the globe is that I have seen by individual people, people exactly like the Chesapeake Conservancy, taking, taking the information, taking it to action, and making things happen. I think the big goal uh, of, of today is to invoke the kind of spirit and vision that would say, here's a great example, can we replicate it? The Campaign for Nature came about with the idea of how can we take what many scientists have been saying, which is that we need to radically scale up the amount of nature that we are safeguarding in protected areas and other conserved areas, and set a, a, a big goal of protecting at least 30% of the planet's lands and seas by 2030 for nature conservation if we're to adequately protect 30% of the planet's land and seas. So that means we're going to have to dramatically scale up the investments from governments, from philanthropies, from businesses. And then we need to make sure that, that those resources get equitably distributed to the communities and to the places where the most significant biodiversity exists. That's going to be one of our major challenges going forward. But then we have the, the large effort of the data that, that Jack mentioned, determining where are the most important 30% to protect making sure that, that that data is democratized and individuals can access it and put it forward so that their governments can, can ensure that the best protected areas are selected, that they're well managed and can monitor them for, for the effectiveness of their conservation. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the power that we have seen technology have to improve conservation and restoration decision making in the Chesapeake, um, but also really looking at how that can scale to be a larger global force for good. There's been a larger focus on data and information creation, um, but from our experience in the Chesapeake and increasingly around the world, what partners really need are insights. They want to know where they should be working, what they should be doing, and not spend the time as much on creating or collecting the data or turning that into information. Managing data and information often requires staff and technical infrastructure that's really beyond the grasp of nonprofits or environmental organizations. And that's really why we are focusing on solutions that help drive insights that work for our partners. The new data allows us to model at the scale that restoration projects are implemented. Our high resolution data was first released in 2016 and has led to a renaissance in conservation planning in the Chesapeake as partners rethink the previous limitations of their work. We're now investing in AI and automation. We can see this integration in the formation of the Chesapeake Conservation Partnership, the CCP, which sought to break down these silos and move conservation organizations towards working in collaboration. The partnership also moves decision-making from sector-specific decisions to multi-sector decisions. We use a common data framework to generate information and insights for each sectors. Uh, farm, forest, habitat, heritage, and public health and recreation. And I think the Chesapeake is just a superb place to think about all of this uh, because this is a watershed that goes all the way up to Delaware County and Northern New York State. Uh, and you saw the maps of it earlier. Uh, and it really, in the end, has to be managed as a system. And that's why this information base that has been developed is so wonderfully instructive. Uh, we can help collectively to uh, scale up the capacity of these governments through providing technology and innovation so that they can map the areas that are most important for biodiversity and that their agencies that would be charged with developing these these maps and implementation have that capacity. So I, you know, my friend Jim Levitt told me once that David Hayes, the former Deputy Secretary of Interior, once said, the big dogs can't do it by themselves anymore. And that always stuck with me, you know, and it, and this whole discussion revolves around empowering the individual landowner, the small mom and pop land trust, the indigenous tribe in the rainforest, 
the underfunded local government agency that, that doesn't even have a planning department, by giving them the knowledge and information they need to defend their most important lands and waters, justify public expenditures or new laws or tweaks to existing laws, make um, philanthropic requests undeniable, which is always really great when the data really showcases why you're proposing a project, but also attracts private capital, you know, a new resource for conservation that we're really trying to pull into the fray here. Speak that are a smaller scale, like out on the Nanticoke River, the middle Chesapeake Sentinel landscape, which is, it's, it's this wonderful consortium of the Department of Defense and nonprofit organizations and local governments that are pooling resources and capital to enhance military readiness and working lands and water quality and biodiversity. And through that um, and previous effort, they've already protected 33% of the watershed. Um, and it's one of the most biodiverse areas in the Chesapeake. So it's a great example of how partnerships and data and collaboration can work together at the local level to achieve these objectives. This broad topic of, of global scale protection and conservation is kind of what got me interested in, in having a career in science. I think, you know, protected areas, what should we protect? Where should we protect it? And does our protection actually do anything? That's many years ago, my colleagues and I wrote a, a article called Flying Blind that was really talking about how we don't have high resolution imagery of the entire planet. And at that time, I was a little more naive and I was thinking, well, we just need the data, right? Um, and then we had high resolution imagery of the entire planet. And I started giving talks about, you know, data deluge and information drought, <laughs> right? So we're drowning in data but we still don't have the information necessary to take the action that we need. And it's why I was so drawn so quickly to, to the work that Joel and Jeff and, and the rest were leading because they were taking these large da raw data sets, right? And converting them into something that humans could actually take action on. And now it's the work of the conservation sector and the technology sector to come together to turn those raw data sets into actionable information. And then it's also our job to ensure that we do that in a way that that information is as easily ingestible into downstream policy processes as possible, and that it's a two-way street. And I think that that's the key part that I would just bring back to this 30 by 30 or 50 by 50 conversation and questions like this, which is how do we ensure that people feel like they're represented? Well, I will tell you that it doesn't matter <laughs> if, if um, you know, there's no way we're going to achieve 30 by 30 or 50 by 50 without figuring yeah. that out. We had that commitment in 1983. We had to fight for it. We have to fight to maintain it. And that's been instrumental for us to be able to come together to make progress in our ecosystem. But phase two is really what we've been talking about. And, and the question is, how do we get that done? My money is on partnership, partnerships and technology. Now I'm like a broken record. I've been saying this for years. I've been writing it in newspaper articles. I mean, you've heard this from me a million times, but my mentor, Pat Noonan, who founded the Conservation Fund, arguably one of the most influential land conservationists in the country here, um, he once counseled me that I should consider leveraging other people's time and other people's money to advance large goals, which was actually a brilliant way of saying that partnerships and collaboration are essential to accomplishing moonshot goals. Opportunity, people realize how much now things that, that are related to nature and the function of, of the world can radically impact their lives. And I think this is a, a, a moment that people are waking up to that. Uh, we need to push for multilateralism at a time where that's um, on its heels, uh, where, where governments are, nature doesn't know these political boundaries and we need to work collectively. We cannot solve the biodiversity crisis individually. We need to solve it with all people in the world, all regions of the world collectively. Is, look, science and technology are not gonna be enough. They, we can do more on that and the planetary a computer and the vision with GIS tools, all, that's all really exciting.
And I, I live that life, I love that life, and we're making progress. But the, the, the thing that's actually gonna make it happen are individual actors, sort of like, you gotta wear your mask. I mean, that's the analogy uh, from COVID, uh, participating. And what I said earlier is COVID gave me a lot of um, uh, good feelings because of what I saw is thousands and thousands and thousands of organizations took the science and the data and the technology and they opened the world's eyes and it resulted in action. Uh, it really it resulted in action. And what we need are organizations like the Chesapeake Conservancy that plays, you know, it's sustainable, they play, they play the game of conservation. And they understand what uh, Tom talked about is that, that it's part of a fabric. It's not just isolating this parcel or that parcel, it's the ecosystem. We need to replicate what Chesapeake has done in the way of organizational structure. I mean, they're, they're able to sustain themselves. They become part of the fabric. We need that kind of rubber stamp implemented in every country at all levels of government. And, uh, that that's really where uh, the, that that's really at where I think about it. I mean, I'm just a technology guy, you know, <laughs> but I'm watching on my screen this amazing global response to a crisis. Got to go at scale. We got to be entrepreneurial and then push it uh, at scale. And 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 Joel, this really speaks to what you're doing and what you're imagining.